there is a lovely story behind the sonata number 27, opus 90 in E minor. This sonata is dedicated to Count Moritz von Lichnowsky, who, after the death of his first wife, fell in love with a renowned opera singer, Josefa Stummer. He wanted to marry her, but other members of his family strenuously objected to that match, and it took him a good three years to overcome their objections and finally marry Josefa. And Beethoven knew of the story and wrote the sonata and dedicated it to the Count. And when the Count and his new wife, Josefa, visited Beethoven and asked him whether there was something behind the music, some extra musical story, Beethoven burst out laughing and said, of course, absolutely, this is the love story of you too. And he said the first movement should be called struggle between the mind and the heart. And the second lovely movement should be called Dialogues or Conversations with the Beloved. This is a lovely story and it is almost certainly completely fake. It was submitted to us in this form by Anton Schindler, Beethoven's secretary. It comes from an entry from 1823, an entry which we know today is falsified like Anton Schindler did with many entries in the conversation books between him and Beethoven. These conversation books were used by visitors of Beethoven at a period where Beethoven could not hear anymore. They would write their questions in the conversation books and then he would reply speaking. So these conversation books, of which quite a few remain, are one way only. We can read the questions, but whatever the replies were can only be submitted to us through those people who wrote them later on, in this case Schindler. We know that those entries were falsified because of extensive ink analysis done on the conversation books in the 1970s, 1980s, which irrevocably damaged the reputation of Schindler as an authority on Beethoven. As it turned out, quite a few things which he had written in his famous biography of Beethoven were simply invented. Um, in this case, most probably, he invented this story to support his claim that Beethoven used so-called poetic ideas as a basis of his compositions. That is, that he was inspired by stories that had no musical connection and he embodied them in music. But most interestingly, this story never fails to catch the imagination of us, the listeners, because it fits so well with the music. So whether or not there is truth in the story, Let's look at the music itself. The first movement, entitled in German only, with liveliness and throughout with um, sensitivity and expression. I have to say, as a small aside, that this sonata came after a long period in which Beethoven wrote almost nothing, including the piano, and nothing at all for piano solo. Uh, a period of six years separates this sonata from the previous one, Les Adieux, in that time, he had composed the 7th and 8th symphony, the last violin sonata, which does include the piano, the overture to Fidelio and Egmont, among other works, also the Archduke Trio, of course, involving the piano, but nothing for piano solo. In Les Adieux, because of a very strong patriotic um, streak which Beethoven experienced, he started writing tempo instructions that usually are written in Italian. He started writing them both in German and in Italian. And in this sonata, as a one-off exper experience, experiment, he decided to write them in German only. So the first movement is titled With Liveliness and Throughout With Sensitivity and Expression. And this conflict between the mind and the heart so um, so carefully told us by Schindler is immediately apparent from the very beginning. So one phrase, but it is divided between two contrasting elements, something which is quite strict and severe, and something in piano which is so much more personal. There is a fascinating
fascinating drama happening in front of our eyes and ears right from the very beginning. Then he continues with something that is an outpouring of lyrical emotion. And how masterful the darkening throughout this phrase. It starts out quite bright. And now every bar, it's like the lights are dimmed a bit. And more. Dotted by a gradually receding harmonies and a gradual descent. And then an even more personal imploring phrase. And this is something quite interesting. The exposition is supposed to start and then lead us into whatever happens next. But here he closes it almost right from the beginning. So we, we've played 24 bars and it seems to stop. So where does one continue from here? He chooses a very atmospheric transition to lead us out of this ending, as it were. Listen to these empty octaves. Ghostly, um, austere, barren. And from that he manages to burst out. So once again this contrast of two very dramatically clashing elements. And now the third time he places this phrase, an unexpected color, B flat, which is completely unrelated to the key where we're at. Something really mysterious. And only here we realize that this B flat is actually A sharp and it will lead us into the next harmony B minor. Now the next transition extremely passionate. complete drop, the most painful outburst, as you can probably see every few bars a change of mood, a change of, a change of character. This is very romantic music in spirit. It is of course still Beethoven, so the elements of the classical style are there, but this idea of turbulent emotion that throws you from one extreme to the other. This is something very romantic in nature. This would, you know, the, the, the sufferings of young Werther. This is, this is, this is the same kind of spirit. Um, the next, we have a gentle flow in the left hand and a almost ghostly floating in the right hand. It is intensely atmospheric. And now with these sighs. This, this really um, heart twisting dissonant. Once again, coming out of this, the stern, severe drama returns. As it 
rotation than size. Then repeating these. It takes just upper voice. And something which was just before chords becomes like little bells in the distance. And from this he builds the development. This idea of something calling from the distance or floating in the mists is quite strongly present here from this. Then this. And finally this. Beethoven loves this kind of austere atmosphere, something which seems to call us from afar. If you think even the opening of the Appassionata, different in mood, but the same kind of barrenness. The sense of disorientation, the sense of we don't really know where we are. Um, the development is quite short, as indeed is the first uh, movement in its entirety. Uh, the first bit is uh, quite dramatic, after a gentle start. It then grows with a crescendo. And then he takes just this motif and repeats it quite insistently. Beethovenian. Um, and then it comes down a bit and we get our little bit of light. This of course was from here. And he will develop it. He first uh, transports it to the tenor. with a very ornate uh, right hand. And for me, this is one of the most powerful moments of the entire movement. After two phrases of where we could have thought that it might be optimistic, might be a bit of light in this darkness, but he in one go completely discards the major harmony and moves us back into minor. So from here... And for me this drop from something which is quite warm to this... Once again quite pale pale, in the distant, uncertain, is very, very powerful. And then he starts building from that place. Now he will start using the thumb as, an, as a painful anchor point. So he moves upwards, which is a standard procedure, but the accent is always on the offbeat note, which makes it more, more painful, I would say. And finally we arrive. This is like a cry out of his heart. And he repeats it twice in fortissimo. And then there is a magical transition. He takes these notes and he seems to have lost his way, so he just repeats them again and again. Same motive, just offset by half a beat. And then again. 
and he does it every time that it's slower and slower written out so it is this is 16th notes semiquavers quavers quarter notes and half notes so it is automatically slowing down so we don't need to add an extra written note to it and now he takes from this he takes just the first three notes and makes them into a motive in themselves going every time to the second note I want to stop for a second on this moment. So this comes from a juxtaposition of just offset not by two notes but by one. And I still remember as a kid hearing this place for the first time and it felt unbelievable because these are quite harsh dissonances. It's like almost wrong notes played by the performer. And then you look at the score and you realize, no, this is not wrong. This is what he wanted. He wanted this very gritty emotional pain coming through those dissonances. And then brings us back to our main theme and this is perhaps the moment when we realize that the first notes of the melody are exactly these three notes that he had been playing with I find this kind of motivic work extremely inspired and magical. These are things that perhaps we don't immediately realize during a performance, but this is so thought through and yet it is not just coming from the brain. If, if we're talking about conflict between the brain and the heart, I would say this place is a great example of a confluence of the brain and the heart. On the paper, it's clever motivic work. He takes a motive, plays it fast, slower, 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 uses then the last three notes, plays them, uh, places them against each other, and then uses this to connect it to the first motive, which incidentally uses the same three notes. And yet, emotionally, it is such a powerful place. And we are back in our uh, known territory. It is only at the end of the movement when once again something unexpected and magical will happen. After he finishes the reprise, which ends in the same way as the exposition, so we have... If it were to copy the exposition, it would have been... But no, he repeats the size again. An octave higher. And again. And now we will have a repeat of our opening phrase, but in pianissimo, ritardando, and as high as he can go. the utmost uncertainty and then he finishes finishes the movement with a last repeat of this heartfelt phrase <laughs> 
masterful dramaturgical construction with a deep understanding of how all these things will act upon us, the listeners, emotionally. The sonata still is not what we call late Beethoven. Um, on the paper, this period starts with his next sonata, the Hammer Clavier, and yet already many of the signs which we associate with late Beethoven are here, particularly a kind of piercing understanding of the human soul and ability to capture extremely nuanced, refined emotions, shades of emotion, something which is not simplistic, which is not easy to describe, to say, ah, this is uh, anger, ah, this is passion, this is, this is hope, something which is multi-layered and complex and so much more realistic because of that because it corresponds much more closely to how we experience emotions and this for me is the main strength of the first movement whatever drama and darkness we had in the first movement it is completely effaced immediately as we start the second It is a song that could have done Schubert uh, a lot of justice, or could have made Schubert proud. He writes in German to play not too fast and very singingly, uh, sehr singbar vorgetragen. One thing to show, we end the movement on these three notes, which of course are our and so and then he takes these three notes and reverses them with a major so what previously was now becomes a very simple musical device to show that also the nature of the music and the fortune of the protagonists of that first movement are now um, going to be reversed. There is a gentle flow of semiquavers. Like a um, gently flowing brook or little river. Again, a close association with Schubert. And above it, the melody just sings all the time. It just continues. This is a rondo where the melody itself, the refrain, is very long and the episodes are maybe even shorter than the melody and this melody is repeated four and a half times throughout the rondo so this is the core of the music and it is just like a balm for the wounded soul. It's just, it is soothing, it is lovely and full of a kind of yeah, loveliness which Perhaps we do not often associate with Beethoven, but when he chooses to express it, it is done marvelously. The, the fourth time the uh, melody appears, he uh, transports it to the tenor. Uh, I just need to find the place. Here, here it is. So if we're talking about the conversations with the beloved, this is the best place to demonstrate it with, because here we have clearly two characters. We have the lower, more warmly sung voice. Mm. 
sponsored by the melody that was singing from the beginning. And again the tenor. And then the soprano once again answering it. And this is still not the end. It, it, it's like a movement which generates its own energy. Um, a rondo would usually have three repeats of the theme. Four is already on the edge of what is too much, not too much. Beethoven sometimes does it. But here we have it even once again. So he keeps going. And still he develops. A little fugato. And we go into a fifth. But this is just the coda. He still hasn't finished. And this is a really interesting ending. Endings, the one we expect from Beethoven is a loud and assertive one. But we know from many of the sonatas that sometimes things just evaporate. But I don't think an ending like this is uh, extant in any of the others quite. Um, we seem to go somewhere, we were not sure where. And then he writes an accelerando, so we start thinking that perhaps this will lead us to an assertive and loud ending. But then all of a sudden, a bar before the end, it's a subito piano and we're back to our usual tempo. So it does evaporate, but before that he deceives us, making us think that perhaps it will be a, um, an extrovert ending. This is lovely how in one bar he crosses three octaves. There is such a feeling of yearning and striving. No written, no written uto, this just ends. Just like that.